It is your weekly show here on the Blue Room. Just another quiet week in the Everton world. <laughs> Crazy. Don't know where to start, but lucky enough, I've got two wonderful guests joining me this week. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see we've got a very relaxed Mike Diasha, who moved from the couch because that wasn't lying down on the couch was a bit too casual to this, and he's moved to lying down on the chair instead. I mean, I'm blaming Les for the whole let's put it on YouTube thing because I'm quite happy usually. Like, this is how you see the sausage get made here because, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've gone to the online thing. And I've quite happily, for most of these things, just lied on the couch under a blanket having quite a nice time. And now I've got to actually make it look like I'm slightly a bit more normal. Not ideal. I mean... That, that's what you want from our guests, for them to be as relaxed as possible when talking about a very unrelaxing subject. So, fair enough, fair enough. And Mick Green all joins as well. Looking considerably more professional, you'd have to say. How are you doing, Mick? Yeah, just the usual, enjoying my life at Everton until Matt ropes me back in to do one of these. <laughs> people must dread that message now, these days. <laughs> when it's like, <laughs> the people who aren't watching Mike is vociferously nodding. But, you know, it's... It's got to be done, lads. We've all got to get through this together, unfortunately. Um, a lot has gone on in the last few hours, and we haven't even spoke. You know, we've got a huge game at the weekend, which no one really seems to be talking about that much, but it is going to be very transfer-heavy today. Uh, the last 24 hours have been pretty insane, truth be told. we had, On Wednesday night, we had Luka Dean put a statement out, which looked... It was like it was going to be a very generic, nice farewell statement. And then you got to the end and you went, oh, my word, Lucas, what on earth have you done there? Uh, his transfer was confirmed on Thursday morning to Aston Villa. And just as we sat down to record this, and while Al Ghazi's low move from Aston Villa to Everton has gone through as well. And we'll, do you know what? We should probably start there because we have signed a player. Um, it is a winger. It's a lad who scored 10 goals last season. I mean, Nick, I'll come to you first on this one, mate. What, what, what are your feelings on, on this one initially? I mean, I think when a lot of people saw the links sort of firmed up over the, the last 24 hours, it's been pretty mixed. You know, there's a lot of people sort of saying, well, a body is a body you know, for a squad that's had so many injuries, look at his goal record, and then others have sort of looked at him and gone, well, is, is this lad any good? Is he going to block the progress of players? I mean, where do you stand on this loan deal, mate? It's... Just don't see the point, to be honest. Um, you know, just before we came on, um, you like, um, mentioned or asked whether I, I can any any numbers of intrigue, and I hadn't even bothered to look really. I think that's usually it's a good sign of how like into this signing I am. Um, you know, I think if you'd asked me, you know, a week ago or just before the the transfer window started, if we needed, you know, a, a, the list of priorities really for for positions for the squad, I think winger probably would have been bottom one. Um, you know, I think the other day I tweeted about Lewis Dobbin and only getting I think, 15 minutes and extra time uh, against Hull. And I know, I think people think he'll be a striker, but I think if he ever makes it for Everton, he'll probably be out wide when considering his stature. Um, and when he's trying to convince someone who's seemingly highly rated by the football club to, to sign a new contract, if you're Lewis Dobbin, you're, you know, I mean, if, if you're Lewis Dobbin anyway, why would you want to sign a new contract? But I think um, if, you, if you're his agent and you're, you're looking for, you know, a final push to your decision, for me, that would that would be it. Because, you, you know, people are probably going to be worrying about what the, the effect and the minutes this might have on, on Anthony Gordon. So I had to think, you know, what this will do to, to Lewis Dobbin and his other parents on, on the substitute bench. I mean, is, is that your make a with this as well, Mike, the, the knock-on effect that it might have on, on a few players? Because, to be honest, I was sort of looking at Towns and coming back at the weekend and thinking, that might push Anthony Gordon a bit further down the pecking order because he's very much the, the manager's man and has done all right and is very dependable. It's, um, I think, like Mick said, it's sort of another body in a place where we, well, probably the only place in the squad we probably don't really need one at the moment. Um, it's a concern. It's not a major one, but it is a very, very big concern. Um, it's just boring, isn't it? Good God, this strategic review is going swimmingly, isn't it? Let's 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 have a look, lads. We'll all sit round in a room, and then um, what have we been doing badly? Okay, well, what we've been doing is the owner of the football club 
has been listening to his super agent mate about who to sign for the football club for a lot of money in most cases. And he's been signing them. Okay, that's the problem. What's the solution? Find the director of football who's been arguing against that and keep doing it. Great. Brilliant. That's that's all it boils down to. Now, sign someone because Keir Jarabshin says, hang on, he's available. Why don't you sign him? It's like Mashiri is a magpie and someone just floats a shiny piece of tinsel in front of him and he absolutely buzzes off it. Oh, I'm so tremendously and utterly bored of it. Just just on the Jarabshin stuff, Mike, I mean, as far as I was aware, he was, El Ghazi was a client of Guest of Feet, which is Jorge Mendes, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people seem to be tying this to, to Jurabachan. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to be told otherwise, but, you know, I don't know if there's a, a definitive link there myself. Well, most of these things aren't done with definitive links. If you go back and you look at most of these players, they might not be represented directly by the man in, in himself, but just because you're not a client, you, you're, a player isn't your client, doesn't mean you can't charge fees for being an intermediary and all those sort of silly things. But yeah, it's just, it's part of this ridiculous thing where the manager doesn't really want a player that much, but gets given them anyway. As you say, as my, as Mick said before, it's in the position that Everton probably need least. So again, we're in this situation where we would be spending probably a, quite a significant sum of wages on someone we don't need when we could loan someone else from somewhere else who could actually provide us with a warm body in a position that we actually do need this year. It's just quite dull, quite banal, quite boring. And as as again, it just it's like we're falling through this tree that is the Premier League and hitting the every single branch on the way down. Because not only is the owner playing football manager for a laugh, as Mick says, any young player now, it's like well, I'm probably not going to get minutes here. Well, everyone else is jumping shit. Well, they'll probably go down. So, mm, I don't know. And it's just getting to be more of Thierry Small, more of Lewis Dobbin, more of those players just aren't going to want to sign, aren't going to want to continue at the absolute basket case of a club that is Everton, not only because of the standard, not only because of the manager, but just how poor the rate is in terms of turning potential into actual talent at this club. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I suppose you know you can level the, the a lot of blame at the manager's door Mick, over the last the last few months, but this one obviously doesn't really feel like it's on him. It does sort of feel like it's it's the owner's one. I mean, someone like Benitez, who is very much his own man, very much likes to have autonomy over all things football matters and, and transfers. I, it's going to be interesting, I think, to see how he sort of responds to, to questions about this, isn't it? Because he's not been shy in the past, as we've seen with mm-hmm. the Luca Dean stuff of of coming out and speaking candidly about situations. You know, he doesn't strike me as the sort of man and the sort of manager that would take to having a player thrust upon him pretty well. I mean, hopefully, you know, he loses his head over it and walks. You know, about, 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 you know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe this is the current plan of machinery or yeah, 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 uh, exactly, you know, yeah. I'm not going to suck it because I don't want to waste any more money. So I'm just going to annoy you all day long. And I'm just going to buy all these players you don't want, and you're going to walk, and you're going to save me money, and then I'm going to, you know, I don't know, appoint David Unsworth as the new manager. Well, I mean, I, to be honest, I get your points. Um, but at the same time, I feel like looking at Al Ghazi, you know, he's a bit of a gruff, quite tall, um, you know, looking at his actual like style as a winger, he, he does actually kind of strike me as a Benitez winger for some reason. Um, and I suppose that. The fact that straight away the, the fear and the like, even with Townsend coming back, is the fear that what this will do to Anthony Gordon. It wouldn't surprise me to see Al Ghazi jump straight over um, Gordon in the pecking order simply because he has experience. Yeah, that that in itself is is a bit of a worry. I mean, what 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 do you think of him as, as a player, Mike? It's to be honest, it's it's hard to sort of envisage what he what he is and how he sort of runs and, and what his what his main attributes are. He, He's just a lad that seems to score the odd banger, the odd penalty, and plays really well against Everton and, and maybe not many other teams. Yeah, score the worldie against Everton, tick. Scores pens, tick. He was one of those players who was in that crop of Ajax youngsters that never really made the grade, that all had so much potential. Do you remember the likes of um, 
Casper Dolberg. It was around that time when it was like mm-hmm. touted as the biggest, bestest thing ever to happen in the world, and it just never did quite click for those sort of players. I can't remember where he went after Ajax, but part of me thinks it was Italy. I think, I can't remember. I think it was Lille. Lille, that was it. I think he was um, part of the before Luis uh, Campos came in and Bielsa kind of just bought everyone. And they tried to just do everything all on, all on the same day, and it just went very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, he just he's one of those players who he's going to give you a solid... Seven and a half, eight out of ten performance, maybe once every ten games. It's just it's not what you want, really, is it? We've got enough of those players, As, and I think it just it boils down to the fact that we have enough wingers. Like Mick saying there, he, he's a Benitez winger. We've got enough of them. Th- there are enough of those already at the football club. Give me a Benitez. Two in the summer. <laughs> Give me a Benitez centre midfielder. Give me another Benitez left back because now we're back down to having one of them at the club. Oh, it's just it, it, it's just it. Baffles belief how ridiculous this football can, can be at times, don't it? Yeah, sorry, Mick, were you going to make a point there, mate? Yeah, I was, you, you mentioned, I think it's good. Because I just had a quick look down of this as summary page, and the only um, two, like, it's a data where he stands out, like, percentile wise, over the last 30, last 30, last 365 days, compared to other wingers and attacking midfielders, the only two is over 70, like, 70 percent percentile is clearances. And headers won, so that is very. So when I'm saying he's very Rafael Benitez, like I feel like that sums it up perfectly. Yeah, I, I didn't realize he was that tall. To be fair, or all that good in the air. So yeah, I mean, let's let let's hope. It, I mean, as as things are tended to go with this football club in recent years, this is obviously uh, more than likely going to fail. But let's hope sort of could come of it. Um, apparently, he's a great penalty taker, like an ac- excellent penalty taker. So. That's probably going to piss Richard Wilson off. So, because <laughs> because he, he probably would have been next in the pecking order after Don missed against Brighton, wouldn't he? And now yeah. you signed a signed a great penalty taker. who's probably going to play. So, um, that that's all to come. But the other the other deal which happened today, Mike, as I said, Luca Dean, twenty five million to Aston Villa, and again, it's it's one of those situations at Everton where it feels like people have drawn the battle lines on this. They're either Team Dinia. Or team Benitez, and but the one thing I will give credit to Luca Dean for is that bloody hell, that that lad knows how to write an Instagram statement, doesn't he? That that was poetic, you know. It was suspenseful. It had heartfelt emotion in it, and it had an unbelievable veiled dig at the end, which I have no doubt will be on a banner in the Gladys Street at some point. But by, by the end of the season, it, it was a bit of a masterpiece. That wasn't it last night. Yeah, the BBC will be trying to tie that up for a three-part series, won't they? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was something quite special, that. Um, as you say, it goes into the, the battle lines drawn and all that. and I don't think I'm team either of them, to be honest with you. I think that you look at Luca Dean, who, before he signed his new contract last February, was already looking for possible ways out of the football club to go and play Champions League football. Fair enough. I thought if you get massive money, because remember the money tout to them was ridiculous, upwards of 45 million if City were going to come in, blah, blah, blah. Um, so he, he has no allegiance to Everton. Fair enough. Yeah, it's, most footballers don't. Um, Benitez obviously has not got on with him, wants a different fullback instead. Yeah, fine. The, the problem I have with this situation is that this is a clash of personalities that has been created solely by far up machine making crap decisions. It's just bring in a manager who is argumentative and likes to turf out players at probably lower than their market value, at least once at every single football club. Yeah, this was going to happen. And to be that pig-headed about it and think like, yeah, this is fine. It's exactly the way it was meant to be. It's just it's just a bit ridiculous for, for my mind. What, what have you made of the situation, Mick, over the last few weeks? It's sort of panned out because it's obviously it went from being dropped for that Arsenal game and Dean just sort of kept his counsel, hasn't he, up until up until that statement last night. He's not really said anything. He's put the odd little thing on Instagram. But but he says went for him last week in the build up to, to that Brighton game and you know, question his professionalism and his, his willingness to work for the team. It's it just feels like this could have all been handled so so much better. Yeah. I think, I think it was the Arsenal game he was dropped for, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, it was his last game for us was the, it was the Derby, yeah. Derby, yeah. Um and I think um whoever the the, uh, the interviewer was on Monday Night Football and I remember I was asking him about the Dean situation. It was very blunt about it. It was like, it sounds like a fallen out. You know, what's going to happen next? And I remember tweeting about it. It was like, this is 
quite worrying really when, when you consider what happened to to Hamas Rodriguez and you consider the, the lack of the lack of assets we have really you know it kind of the fact that I mean 25 million you know I suppose is on the, the face of it is okay for a 28 29 year old but like Mike was talking about the the type of numbers that had been touted in the past I think straight away you're looking at the knock-on effects in which that in the summer if it's one of the Charles and all Calvert-Lewin's got to leave we're gonna to have to bleed every bit of you know, every penny possible out of that because we're already desperate for cash. And I think that was why clubs like Chelsea could, you know, have us over, you know, a battle a little bit, you know, a couple of weeks ago asking only for loan or or only wanted a cheap deal because they, they know we're, we're, we're in need of money. And I think soon as really, you know, Benitez has said that, um, I actually can't remember what he said, but the, the whole situation as soon as it came out, it was, it was very easy to see that there was going to be no way back. And I think... It's 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 a, it's a you know it's a, not a sad ending but it's a, a deflating ending you know I think Dean's done nothing wrong over his his, his everything career you know he's had the, the few bad performances but I think that's fair enough considering the, the type of teams he's been in the type of managers he played for um and yeah I wish him to be honest nothing but the best um I hope he he does okay for Villa apart from in a couple of weeks time and I think really I suppose the the whole Lucas Dean situation and the 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 Anwar Elgazi you know transfer coming this way I think if you wanted anything to epitomise Everton over the last couple of months or even the you know under Farhad Mashiri completely you know that's all you need to, as the perfect example really isn't it hmm. yeah it, it does sort of feel Mike as though you know fans are using this as just sort of another thing to rally behind to show that they're not that fussed on the manager doesn't it I mean Luca Dean was was a good player he seemed like a, a nice lad but some of some of the emotional responses we've seen from people on social media and some of the, the, the lamenting of his departure. It just, you know, this, this is like you said, this is what Everton have signed up for with Benitez, isn't it? That when things are going badly and people have turned against them, anything that goes wrong or anything negative that happens is going to be used as a, a bit of a stick to beat them with. Yeah, yeah, and you, do you know what, Matt? You spoke about this in the summer. That as soon as the first thing goes wrong or something calamitous happens it will be used solely to beat the manager with. But again, it's not what people are annoyed about. People are annoyed about the, the fact that this situation was utterly foreseeable in the summer. As soon as Benitez became manager, you could go through all of his clubs and say he's always going to pick one sellable asset that he doesn't quite like, make an example of them, try and stamp his authority on them, and then get rid of them, usually at diminished cost. You look at the likes of Xavi Alonso. It's just, it always always happens it's boring um and it's predictable and it's just it's the pig-headed narrative that luca dean is the one in the wrong here which i find a bit baffling he might have clashed with benitez over style over tactics you name me an everton fan who hasn't in the past what what six months name me anyone because we can all say to go oh, that's that's a bad attitude well no, it's not. And just just to banish someone over that, Mike feels like the sort of decision a manager would make from a from a bygone era. Because 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 play, players, you know, the, the modern player is more opinionated and and you know is more willing to come out and speak about things, speak about tactics, is more clued up on that sort of stuff. Probably takes a bit more pride in you know the numbers that the you know the people like Mick break down so well. You know, it's all out there for them, isn't it? And you know, it's, it feels like a a decision made from a manager from a bygone era for a modern player? Well, it is a decision made by a full-born dinosaur, in it? In terms of style, in terms of man management. It's what we've got. It's what we've put up with and it's what we will continue to put up with because the owner is completely steadfast with this is going to be the one that he doesn't change his mind on, which is the most evident thing in the world. Um, it is, it's just so stubborn and just a, such a stupid thing to fall out over. But the the view that Luca Dean is this bad apple is just a bit weird. He's been nothing but a consummate professional throughout his time at Everton. Performed admirably. He's probably been one of Everton's more, most successful signings of the Farhad Mashiri era in terms of how he conducts himself and the actual output on the pitch. It's not saying much, but he has been. And you look at the statement that was put out today when he left on Everton's website, and it's, what, three lines. No good luck, no well wishes, no all the best for the future, not even any of the platitudes that you would get. Like, it was something you would expect to see when Ross Barkley left the club. Now, that, <laughs> but you know what I mean? That's acrimonious. Yeah. That was 
that was horrible. That whole thing could have been avoided, and it was majorly from the players' side. This really isn't, but it's kind of been spun the same, and that's only coming from one place, and it's the football club. And it's just, it's quite depressing to look at that. That's what the football club is becoming because you you line up the two, the two um, statements and messages. You look at Luca Dean's and you look at Everton's. One of them comes across with a sense of class. One of them's petty, quite vindictive and just classless. Everton have gone through this entire situation. I think you've said it a few times, but it could have been dealt with in a much neater way. They didn't need to get involved in this mucky slanging match. Do you know, all you need to do, if you have a manager like Benitez, you're having a press conference, just go, well, just shut all the questions down. You don't have to talk about it. He doesn't actually have to say all the things he does. He doesn't have to make it sound like Luca Dean is self-centered, selfish, only putting himself before the club. To me, it sounds like what's happened is he's questioned the absolutely god-awful tactics that have been going on. His position in the team as a main creator being diminished, which has been one of our most attacking and useful outlets in recent years. Well, yeah, put me in a room with Rafa Benitez. I'll probably say the exact same thing. It, the it, irony is that we've like since since that's happened, like we since switched to a system whereby the two fullbacks are you know the two most creative players in the team. Um, arguably our most creative player, well, two most creative players over the last couple of months have, have been sold. It's just it's insane. It it it's absolutely baffling the way they have handled this, the way the managers handled it, and the way that the ownership have handled it. And to me, it absolutely reeks of a club that is going down. There is no one is pulling in the right direction at that club. You can see that some of the players were quite happily open, quite happily criticize and question what is going on, as they should, because we all are, because it's ridiculous. But yet the management and the um the ownership are trying to just push on to Moscow, just carry on, do how they're doing. And it's sorry, but it doesn't work like that now. It's just terrifying. Yeah. It is, it is, it is what, and I think it was interesting that a lot of the players like the statements last night, Dean, you're on Instagram, which all which, oh, it contained an obvious dig at the manager of the football club in it. And you know, there's a few little messages. I mean, I, I don't care about what Bernard's got to say or anything like that, but a few of the lads who are at the football club now openly liked it and openly sent messages. And maybe you can read too much into that, but I think typically in that situation, if someone's leaving and having a pop at the manager, then I imagine if people were on board maybe a bit more, they'd be like, hmm, just going to stay away from that. Not going not gonna to interact with that, that kind of post at all. But I just, just, I know it's, I think we probably all agree, Mick, that it's been badly handled this and Everton have, you know, let themselves down in regards to, to, to the way in which it's come about. But is, is the overall outcome here a, a decent one for us in terms of the fee that Everton have got for them and getting in two younger players through the door? For round about that fee, but maybe a little bit more, who can potentially be around here for a bit for a bit longer and potentially develop. I mean, that 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 is the model we've all been asking Everton to adhere to for a long time, isn't it? Yeah, I think to be fair, I think you know, going into the summer, he's probably someone I would have actively looked to to have sold anyway. But I think look, you know, it's it's just the whole situation, isn't it? I think you know, Mike mentioned it then about the you know, Benitez practically for for unprovoked really ranting. In, in, in the press conferences, you know, even the, the Hamas Rodriguez situation was, was dealt better. You know, there was at least, you know, a little bit of, you know, secrecy behind it in terms of, you know, he was always injured or, you know, I think he did have COVID at one point, to be fair. And, you know, he, he would go absent, you know, absent in, in stages where, you know, he was meant to be playing or, you know, he'd be training all week and then he wouldn't be in the match day squad. Whereas with this, with this is, you know, he's, he's actively just came out and said, you know, it was just like unnecessarily really consistently brought it up. You know, I thought the the well, so, sorry the, to interrupt you, Mick. Just I think I think you're so right to what you're saying. And the thing that makes me think like that even more that the manager's sort of trying to make a point over this is having him on the bench against Brighton. What, I mean, what, yeah, what on earth yeah. what on earth was that all about? You know, to, clearly at that point bridges have been burned. He was never ever gonna get on the pitch. There's clearly been a big falling out. What what kind of points was I mean, I, I don't know what kind of point it was, but he's clearly trying to make a point of some sort there, wasn't he? Well, I think it's, I think that's quite a good, um, good example of how out of touch he's been over the last couple of months in terms of that. You know, there was only going to be even with Dean. You know, you knew he was on the bench, and you knew he wasn't going to be coming on. 
or you know, as soon as he goes out to war, war dwarf, basically anything else that's going to happen, considering well, considering the results anyway. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's a good example of how how poorly you know managed but he said has been over over the last couple of months. I think you know, I saw a tweet the other day, and it was very simple. But you know, being a football part of being a football manager is is, is managing people and managing situations like this, and the fact that he's just made it worse. Is, is 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 kind of sums up his his reign so far. I think it saves the actual transfer though. I would have liked more money, you know. But obviously that's the you know the the situation. And like I said a couple of minutes ago, you you now I think we now do have to sell one of Richardson or Calvert Lewin and so on because of the fact we've only got twenty five instead of thirty five. And um, yeah, hopefully you know Malenko does 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 well. You know, it does a lot of pressure on him now to do so. Thank God that Aston Villa are in the position to actually spend like a significant amount of money. Oh, I thought we'd end up having to sell them for like 10, 15 million in the end. Yeah. I, I think that when you looked at how the situation was going, maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, you look at the likes of Chelsea going, well, we'll give you 10 million quid or just take one loan for like 2 million. Like, you know, if that'll do for you. I thought that was the situation we were going to be pushed into. But like in the circumstances, it's a decent fee. As Mick says, actually turning over the likes of Luca Dean is the model Everton have to operate. You look at a player who's approaching 28, 29 years of age, send the hand in them a five year deal, you have to sell them for top dollar. You have to sell them for that 40 million while they're still motivated. As soon as you get that five year deal, that motivation is just going to dip and dip and dip, especially at the club of Everton's position. Um, but as he says, in the situation, yeah, it's a good fee, but it never should have got to this point. You're still a 35 million pound fullback. He's just not going to go for that because the manager's making it clear every single week that he wants him gone. It's just, it's kind of ridiculous. And it'll get to a situation in the summer, as Mick says, where one, if not both, I think probably both, Richardson and Calvert Lewin will ask to leave the football club and probably will be sold. And it's going to mean that those deals will probably have to go through and Everton will have to start the nth rebuild of the last. And years just as usual it's just going to be the next cycle of stupid mistakes with Bruce's millions on the horizon but who knows maybe we'll be in the championship and what? won't actually be able to do it no but seriously like yeah it's well gonna be, it's going to be a consideration in it like if if they're both in the squad and Everton get relegated you're going to get much less money for them that's just how it's going to be and they're both going to want to go this situation has engineered itself now where because players are being pushed out the door or are starting to outright mutiny within their own little groups, then they are probably already looking for moves. And you just hope that, bloody hell, I do hope that we are in the Premier League come the end of the year and can actually get top dollar for them. Because if not, I'd really struggle to see how Everton actually pull themselves back from the abyss that they're staring into. Yeah, yeah I totally agree with everything, everything you said. And when you said about both of them potentially going in, in the summer, you know, as much as... I love both of those lads. If Everton were a well-functioning club that operated between the European spots and you know the bottom half of the top half of the table, if that makes sense, then you'd, you'd accept that and you'd say, well, these lads are obviously going to go on. You're going to get big fees for them. What a chance to reinvest in the squad, improve other areas, and then do the same thing again. That's that's not what we've done over the years. Um, you know the the prospect of getting. I mean, how, how much money are you looking at for, for them? To it's going to over a hundred million, wouldn't it? Be sold both of them in the I summer. Mean, you'd be hoping for that for one. Yeah, one, but yeah, you, if yeah, you know that that's that that's that is a lot of money to spend. That's enough to, to rebuild a squad. But the prospect of that money being in the hands of, I mean, who who whose hands would it be in? If we're going to be trying to sign, would it be in Machiris? Would it be Benitez? No, no. You know, what, I mean, would it be in somebody else after the end of this strategic review? And I think that that's sort of where I go back to what I was saying before about the this this month. And on the face of it, you look at that Dina going out and Patterson, Mikolenko coming in. You say, right, that 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 that's what I don't know. If, you know, interrupt me if I'm wrong. Yeah, you know, I think that's what us three all want to see Everton do. That that is the model ideally that Everton should be looking to do because of where we are and we've done it terribly in the past. The issue is, is that we've done it mid-season. We've done it in circumstances where Dean has effectively been booted out the door for a reduced fee, as you said. 
And we've done it in a situation where Mikalenko in particular is going to come into a team at left back that's won one Premier League game in 12 and just be asked to do a job straight away and fit in mid-season in a league he's never played in, in a, in a country he's not familiar with. And it's going to be, it's, you know, that, that part of it just feels a bit mad. And I, I don't know if this is just, we've done this this summer because someone went rooting through Marcel Brands' desk drawers after he'd gone and found out, you know, a profile on these two players. And went, oh, actually, these look all right. Let, let, let's sign these in this window. Or whether it's going to be a long-term strategy. But it feels like they've got half of this right. And I'm concerned about how it's going to go because of the situation we're in as a team. And I'm concerned about when we get to the summer, if we sell one of those players that you mentioned, or sell both those players that have been mentioned, whether it's something we're going to carry on with. Because at the moment, who's doing the scouting at the football club? Who's setting the strategy at the football club? No, no one really seems to have a clue. Maybe at the end of the, maybe this strategic review is going to solve everything. Maybe after that, it's all going to be sound, Nick. And you know, we'll be unearthing gems from all across European football. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't think so, but, um, but yeah, I can imagine that. I can imagine the, the, the strategic review going on and everyone will be sitting in the boardroom and in a live building. I think that's where it is anyway. And Because I, I highly doubt Farah Mishiri is, you know, involved in the in the, the strategic review. I just I just can't see it. But I can imagine those who are and they, they feel they're making maybe some sort of progress and then, you know, one of them gets a text through that. If I had, you know, agreed to to buy Al Amar Al Ghazi, <laughs> everyone just puts their head in their arms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but even but even then, it's like you know, there's, there's hardly anyone left at the football club at the moment in terms of you know, director of a football club. I think it's um, Dave Harrison at the moment, isn't it? Who's great, great shot. Well, yeah, but but even then, it's like you know, the transfer window will end in a couple of weeks, and the, the likelihood is we'll have signed, you know, four players coming from you know. Three different people, almost in terms of you know, Michael and Cohen Patterson, believed to be, you know, Marcel Brands on Marcel Brands' shortlist. You've then got El Ghazi, who's, you know, clearly been brought through the links Machiri has. And then I expect Longstaff will come in, who seems very much a Benitez person. You know, I remember reading in uh, The Athletic a couple of months ago how. Everton the only football club where, as you know, if you want to get an opinion on some player, you you've got to speak to like four different people. And the fact that there's not even it doesn't even feel like there's four different people at the football club left at the moment, and that's still <laughs> the case. You know, I, I can imagine like people at the club still, you know, texting Marcel Brands on a Friday night, asking what they think about this player. You know, he's almost <laughs> still in like a half ass consultancy role, just not on the payroll. It just you know, what you're saying that about the, the three different sort of Roots that these players have come through it just reminds me of that summer when we got Rooney in. He was very much a machinery. He came right by. We got Klassen in. He was the the Cooman one, and then we got Sigurdsson. He was the uh, the Steve Welsh one. Doing we as free number tens. It was almost like they went right, lad. Let, let's have a number ten off and see see who's is the best come the end of the season. It just it's absolutely mad that you know, just re- save mistakes, isn't it, Mike? And. Listen, I ho- hopefully what what they've done in regards to the youngsters this month is is, is a starting point, but it's hard it's it's you know it's hard to see it as a, a start of a long term strategy. This isn't it. It's hard to see any other situation unfolding over the next twelve months than if Everton stay up, which hopefully they do, then Calvert Lewin and Richardson get sold. Um, Mashiri is then swamped by texts by his mates saying, "Sign him." Yeah, I've got this fella here. Yeah, it'd be good. Sign him. And those players get signed for a lot of money. And Everton find themselves in the same situation once again in probably about three years. Or probably worse, because they will probably have been relegated by then. Um, the only way I can see this strategic review working is if they do a little bit like what happened in the US office, where you get Creed thinks he set himself up a website and someone has literally just loaded up a Word doc for him so he can just type his nonsense. <laughs> just get one of them for Mashiri. Just some, someone load up like a Word doc or like a burner phone with no like page you go minutes on it and just let him do his nonsense on there and then let everyone else carry on because Jesus Christ, this can't carry on. <laughs> I feel like I'm taking insanity pills at this point because it's just so ridiculous. There is not many jobs that high up in football where I genuinely believe that people I talk to in the pub could do a better job than the person who's doing it. 
and Farhad's Mashiri's job, I genuinely think most people in the pub would do a better job than he is at the moment. Uh, it's just, it's it's terrifying. It's it's terrifying. It's utterly depressing. And yeah, hopefully the will of rummage round Marcel Brands' draws. Found, well, that sounds horrible, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> his desk and, draws. His desk draws. <laughs> and found um, found a few more names for the summer of promising youngsters to bring in because right now they still don't have a head of recruitment. Still don't have a head scout. Still don't have anyone sort of plotting where the football club's going. It's just Farhad Mashiri being tantalised by shiny things. It's just crazy. But ah, well, what can you do? <laughs> Mick looks fully depressed at, at the moment. I mean, I thought, I, I thought you were going to jump in to make a point there, but I think you were just lulling, <laughs> lulling into the screen, just, just your head getting lower and lower. Like, I was uh. just thinking depressively, really. Oh, I, almost, I almost like convinced myself that maybe relegation wouldn't be a bad thing because... At least then I can see a situation where Mishiri's like, not in the Premier League? Oh, don't care. Okay. 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 Uh, it but... just, you're at the point now where you kind of think good things will not happen until he goes away in some mm. way or another. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, had the same, yeah, I had the same discussion today. Like The only hope I've got really is that the stadium gets built, Mishiri then sells, and then we can kind of kick on. Um, the only short-term hope I have is that, you know, we do appoint a new director of football and he has... He's someone who has a backbone, really. You know, we've got no slight really against Marcel Brands because we don't know the ins and outs of what happened. But um, the only hope I've got is that a director of football comes in. And even that's why, like, you know, I'm all for, and you know, I think we're all very, aware, very well aware that Mitez isn't the man for, for this football club, short term, long term, whatever. Even if, you know, some of the transfer business has been okay. Um, you know, I don't think Sakhalim's going to solve everything, even if it will solve some things. But the only thing that I think, that can give me some sort of optimism is a new director of football coming in, streamlining the whole football club, appointing a new manager and kind of just telling, you know, just giving someone with the confidence that Mishiri, someone who has the confidence from Mishiri's side so, so that he'll stay away from, from the football operations, which he should be anyway. You should finance the football club and that should be it. I mean, but I think, it, I think the only person who would have the confidence and full backing of Farhad Mishiri as a director of football it's far had machinery. Well, well, when you mention Creed, then I can see a situation where it won't be the word documents, it'll be when he ends up being the manager for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 it's just, I just wasn't thinking about it then. Like, I remember like when he used to read about like, you know, Serie A clubs are in crisis, he'd like sack the manager every now and then, and the Rose would do mad stuff like. Like that, or sign plays, you think, oh, God, that that's wild that that, that that even happens over there in that division. And like now, now it's like just the norm for us, isn't it? That that we've got on. A, I mean, I've not I've not necessarily seen this confirmed anywhere. And of course, we'll hear what the manager's got to say about it tomorrow. But if the owner is signing plays for the football club, you know, the owner's been signing plays for the football yeah. club for years now. It feels very Palermo, doesn't it? it like it, it, it's. It, it's blatantly obvious at this point that Everton are the worst run club in the league. I don't even think it's close anymore. I think a few years ago, you could probably say maybe West Ham and Newcastle got there. But obviously, Newcastle was always by choice. Mike Ashley was always a very clever man who was just stingy as feck. Hmm. Whereas West Ham were just insane. Now, it's just Everton. There is no worse run club than them. Hopefully. And there's only one way that that goes unless something changes. And as Mick says, you need the director of football to come in and be given responsibility. Because no matter how much backbone or sway Marcel Brands had, when the fella who's signing off the checks to sign players can just go and do it for 10 minutes outside a meeting and come back in and go, just, anyway, lads, I've signed Alex Awobi. I'll see you later. That's <laughs> What do you do? What do you do with that? Just send an email around. But like, do you remember the, the, the stories also from the Athletic talking about Marcel Brands being absolutely shocked at the idea that Mashi was on the phone trying to sort out a deal for Wilfred Zaha while he's like basically like new labour handing over the keys going, yeah, we've got no money, lads. <laughs> like, it's just, it, it, it's baffling, but 
again, what do we do? What else, what else can we do? We sit here, we moan about it, and we'll moan about it every week because it's what we do. And we'll be back again every single week for it and in the hope that they don't get relegated. But as Mick says, maybe that'll be okay. Who knows? But we'll cross that bridge when they get beaten by Norwich at the weekend. Well, well when, you, when you said the only way Everton won't be the worst run club in the Premier League, I thought you were going to say to get relegated in the Championship. Oh but... yeah, then they can <laughs> then they can be having, having it out with all them absolute mentalists down there because he'll have he'll have an absolute field day there because he'll be like, look, look at them over there, you know, well worse than us. When you've got some chairman maybe bending his office to the ground or if, something. If we got relegated, do you think Mashiri's first shine and would be in the Championship for us? Danny Drinkwater. <laughs> I reckon he'd go Lukas Djokovic. He's doing a decent job there at the moment, isn't he? Bring him, bring him home. Mick? Charlie Austin. Charlie Austin. That's, That's a great a shout. That's, That's a great a shout. One. That's a great you shout. Can, you can straight away, you can see the whole narrative now. What's, um, what, 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 what's, what's Robert Snodgrass up to these days? He's at West Brom in the Championship. You, you can see straight away the football club being the type of club that gets relegated instead of, you know, doing what Wolves did and basically buying players that are absolutely too far like far too good for the championship they'll buy players who have been who've played well in the championship yeah. we need to adapt to the championship oh. that's what they'll do well of course oh Mark God. Warburton is our manager Mark Warburton yeah <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting annoyed about next summer already yeah oh my God oh my God Mark Warburton it'll be it'll be Rooney one there surely it would probably be Rooney yeah it'll be him or Dyche I reckon if they got relegated Rooney, egg, man. yeah, I can see that. Yeah, Rooney, Charlie Austin, dream team. Anyway, but yeah, we'll revisit that in a few yeah, weeks. I'm sure. We, I'm sure we can have that conversation in the summer. Uh, just very quickly before we wrap up, Norwich Saturday, like I said, massive game, but no one's really talked about it. Um, at least good Mick to see Mina, Richarlison, Dom all, all back in training this week, and we should have something close to resembling a full strength Everton team on Saturday. Yeah, it's nice for me and Richardson to be fit just in time for the, the international break at the end of the month. <laughs> That's not you being cynical, is it, mate? No, it's like I swear that's the same thing happened last time. Mina was injured and he just came back. It's always the last game before the international break, and then Colombia played him like three times in like seven days or something. And he breaks down, doesn't he? Um, but yeah, it'll be nice to have them back because I hate the term must win, but bloody hell, it'll be, there'll be some horrific scenes if we we lose because Norwich yes. have been absolutely horrendous the last couple of weeks they had that bit of a surge when Dean Smith came in but got beat again last night didn't they yeah they've we, lost the last six without scoring haven't they yeah, yeah we I think hate, there's some we, sort of record on the line wasn't it they? on Saturday if they do it again it'll be the record which obviously like it's just it's it summarised it against Hull didn't it what 44 seconds in a goal down you're like well, yeah this team can't keep clean sheets, but it, we hate the term must win. But if this team wants to stay in division, this is a must win game. Mm-hmm. And if they don't win this game, he's got to be sacked because it will be the only way they will stay up in the division. If they win it, maybe they'll have enough by hook or by hook by crook to get to like what 36 37 points, which should be enough. But yeah, this is properly must win now, and it's terrifying because you shouldn't be at this stage, it's just. It's awful. It's hard to work out like how much peril we're in at the moment because I know there's eight points between us and the relegation zone. I mean, we are in peril because we've gone almost a third of the season and only won one game in, in the last few the last few weeks. But because the, the table's all over the place in regards to games played and stuff like that, it's it's so I think it only starts to become clear in a few weeks like where where we actually should be in the league. These next few games. That's the only thing. That's the only thing stopping it from being complete disarray is the fact that the clubs below us haven't played or I think Burnley especially haven't played in many games but I think literally the fact that the, the table's so jumbled up I think it's given some people a bit of peace of mind like they, they played half a season and haven't made it to 20 points that's yeah. panic mode like mm. if you have a bad run or more injuries mm. it's all well and good saying yeah it'll be fine when players come back from injury well, Calvert-Lewin wasn't included in last week's squad because he was already getting tightness in the same injury that he's got. He's not going to be match fit for another three, four, five weeks. Yeah, I is probably going to break down another once, twice this season. It's just, it's going to be close. It's going to be closer than a lot of people think it will be at this point. Um, and this is massive. 
if they don't win this, he well, he should have gone weeks ago, but if this would be the one you would think that would wake them up and go, yeah, he actually does need to go. I think we'll definitely see what the you know what actually happens for the rest of the season over the next couple of weeks. I think it's Norwich this Saturday, Villa, and then it's Newcastle and Leeds in the league. I think potentially the, the Bailey match is going to be moved as well. I can get mm. that seeing that getting moved. Yeah, recently like coming up too as well. So the next couple of games, even Villa at home, they're only three points above us. Yeah, if you but, if you end up. If you end up with ten points from them games, everyone can sort of breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah, you I think we'll see. that with three, four yeah. points. You are going down. That Villa game is going to be insane. Yeah. There's, there's, there's just so much to unpack going into that, but it's just a shame it's an early kickoff because the atmosphere. Oh god, I know, I know. But there is the opportunity then to just drown your sorrows all day after it. Which, uh, <laughs> yeah. which might be required, but we'll leave it there, lads. It's been a been a pleasure, albeit the conversation was pretty darn beat. We'll let Mike get back to the couch and let Mick get back to doing whatever number crunching he was undoubtedly He's doing. He's going back to the couch. You go back to the couch, Mick? You have to lie down after this? Or... Yeah, yeah, just there. Yeah. Just there. Yeah, Thank just you. a shame there's no Bundesliga tonight, unfortunately. There. <laughs> oh, it's the, the Reds are playing, aren't they, in the, the Carabao? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, definitely won't be watching that. Uh, so <laughs> uh, but no, cheers to Mick. Cheers to Mike. Uh, if you want to hear more from us as ever, come and join us over on Patreon on the Blue Room Extra, patreon.com slash the Blue Room Extra. I uh, spoke to Sam Tag earlier from the Football Ranks podcast on our, and well, our guys. He said he turns up, lads, at once every three or four games and looks like Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. yeah. It's just what um, we don't need. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like Cristiano Ronaldo that anyway, to be yeah. fair. <laughs> God, if he, only t- if he only looks like him once every three games now, this version, that, that is a worry, isn't it? But... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. It's patreon.com slash the Blue Room Extra if you want a bit more from us. Uh, we'll have post-match of the weekend and we've got mailbag and weekend preview as well. So cheers for tuning in today. We'll speak to you again very soon. <laughs>